I just want to welcome everyone today um, as we're celebrating Eunice Kennedy Shriver Day. It's such an important day for Special Olympics and for Special Olympics Florida. Um, I want to introduce myself. My name is Emily Krzyzewski and I work really closely with Special Olympics Florida on the communication side. Um, and so today we're really going to be talking um, and honoring Eunice and the incredible impact that she had on Special Olympics. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the panelists that we have here today. Um, I did want to let you know that at the end of this, we are going to open up the floor um, for a few questions for a few members of our media audience that are joining us here today. Um, for those media that do have questions, there's a chat icon at the bottom of the screen. You can send over um, some of those questions and Carrie Jester from my team will be uh, fielding those questions at the end. Um, so we'd love to hear from you um, and be able to um, answer some of those questions for you. Um, but in order to get started today, I want to introduce you to those panelists. So First and foremost, we've got Sherry Wheelock, who is none other than the Special Olympics Florida President and CEO. Um, she is definitely a beloved leader across the state here in Florida um, and has worked with the organization for many years. Um, you know, and her unending dedication to athletes, volunteers, coaches, staff members, partners, and the communities. Um, you know, under her leadership, Special Olympics Florida has grown to now serve more than 60,000 athletes across the state of Florida, um, which is such a monumental number um, and has created such impact across the organization. Um, she's also named by Orlando Business Journal's Women Who Mean Business. Um, so Sherry, thank you so much for your time today. We're really excited that you're going to be a part of this panel today. Um, I'd also like to introduce uh, you to Nancy Sawyer who joins us today um, and has <laughs> dedicated, believe it or not, more than 54 years of her life to Special Olympics. Um, she's one of the ones that has hand in hand worked with Eunice Kennedy Shriver. Um, and during her time with Special Olympics, Nancy has served as our Senior VP of Health Programs and Athlete Leadership for Special Olympics Florida. And she was also inducted into Special Olympics Hall of Fame. So Nancy, thanks so much. We're excited to have you here today. Um, and then just to mention the rest of our panelists here today, we also have um, Dr. Daniel Armstrong, who serves as uh, the University of Miami Senior Associate Dean for Child Health, Director of the um, Mailman Center for Children Development and Professor and Executive Vice Chair Department of Pediatrics at University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Um, one of the great things about Dr. Armstrong is he's had the great fortune to meet Eunice um, on several occasions, including when her son Anthony hosted the Best Buddies board meeting um, at the Mailman Center. Um, I think he'll share a little bit more with you, but I know his favorite memory was getting to spend some time one-on-one um, -on -one with Eunice when he visited her at the Mailman Center. And then finally, but certainly not least, we definitely have um, Andy Miras and his mom, Anna Maria, with us today, which we're so excited. Um, Andy is a Special Olympics athlete who is an international global messenger, swimming gold medalist, and world record holder. Yay. <laughs> um, Andy was also indu induced into Special Olympics at the age of eight when um, um, and has since traveled the world. And what's really awesome about Andy is that he competes and he speaks on behalf of Special Olympics when he, makes, when he travels. In 2017, Andy was inducted into Special Olympics Florida's Hall of Fame, and he was awarded an honorary EPSI in 2017. And then Aunt, uh, Anna Maria, Andy's mom, has been a champion for children and adults with intellectual disabilities um, for many years. When Andy was just nine months old, she began putting him in swimming lessons. And after seeing the benefits and impact of that, she recruited a group of moms to start, to start Special Olympics swimming program called Baywatchers. Um, in 2014, Special Olympics Florida, Miami-Dade County actually named their Family of Year Award after Anna Maria, and she served on the board for Best Buddies. So I think you would agree that we have a fantastic group of panelists here today to talk about Eunice and her impact on the organization um, and what that continues to uh, carry through today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry Wheelock um, to uh, give you um, some, some of her insight. So thank you, Emily, and uh, thank you to everyone that's joining us today. I'm truly honored to be um, as part of this panel um, with individuals who actually knew Eunice and, and had that personal interaction. Um, she really built Special Olympics on her belief that sports could be a common ground to unite all people, and that sports was a tremendous platform to allow 
all of us, and especially people with intellectual disabilities, the way to show their abilities to the world. And so Special Olympics, you know, provides year round sports training and competition to children and adults with intellectual disabilities. And we do this all because it not only shows their abilities to the world, but it also helps them build confidence that allows them to become even bigger contributors into our community. Um, so I'm so proud that uh, to be part of this panel um, for a visionary uh, like Eunice Kennedy Shriver, who is truly a pioneer um, in the field of sports, but also in believing in people's abilities. Um, I think one of the things that you know Eunice struck me um, from just reading about her and learning from her son, um, uh, Tim Shriver, who's our chairman, is just the empathy that she had and um, the belief in others. I, I think that is really what has been a huge fuel uh, to keep the ignition on this tremendous, tremendous charity and mission. Um, I think the other big thing that she did is really made it a grassroots effort. Um, the ability for volunteers to drive the program and to really steward um, our athletes, but also those that want to be part of this program is what I believe has um, made it so successful for nearly 52 years now. Um, without that you know, support from volunteers. And here in the state of Florida, we have over 38,000 volunteers who make this program possible for the over 60,000 athletes that we have. Um, but as you can imagine, worldwide, internationally, um, with over 170 programs, um, without volunteers, we really couldn't create and drive the mission that she, she was such a big visionary on. Um, going forward, you know, I, as I mentioned, um, each of these panelists will be part of sharing kind of the passion that, you know, Eunice brought to the mission and, and used to become such a great leader uh, and spokesperson for persons with intellectual disabilities. But in Special Olympics Florida, I'm really proud, um, not only of the growth that we've had in the athletes, but in our um, vision to see health as a big piece of what we do. Um, uh, Nancy, as you mentioned, was is a big leader in our healthcare programs. And uh, she too believed that someone who's healthier is gonna do better on the playing field as well as in their daily lives. And so in the future, health will continue to be a big part of what we do. Um, we did nearly 13,000 health exams last year, and we're really gonna have a huge focus on our strong minds and mental health program uh, in the future, near future. And then finally, Unified is really where we see the future of Special Olympics. Uh, unified people with and without intellectual disabilities coming together, having experiences in the classroom, in the workplace, in the community, to really grow and learn from each other, what special abilities we have, our differences, and then really growing to accept each other and learning from each other. And so that more than anything is where we see the future for Special Olympics Florida and how we're gonna really create an inclusive community, which I believe was Eunice's ultimate vision for Special Olympics. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sherry, for that. That's wonderful. Um, Nancy, do you want to go through and give us some of your insight and in, in how closely you worked with Eunice as well? Um, sure. I guess uh, not knowing the age of those that are with us today, um, it's my honor to share a few insights. And I think it's good to look back at history a little bit because in the 60s, uh, most people with intellectual disabilities were in institutions. Um, they really didn't have services. They weren't able to go to school as we now know, special education or even regular education. They weren't really um, looking at socialization, play, recreation, sports. And so this is the passion from whence Mrs. Schreiber came. Um, because of her um, older sister, Rosemary, um, it focused her passion and her whole family's passion on everything that Special Olympics uh, really did. Um, in 57, she became the chairman of the uh, J Joseph P. Kennedy Foundation. In 62, she started the Camp Shriver in her backyard in Maryland. And in 68, voila, Special Olympics began. So right there, you can see that she was a powerhouse. She didn't stop. Uh, and it was a family thing. As Sherry said, um, her son Tim is the chairman. Her other son is the CEO of Best Buddies. Um, her sister was the founder of uh, Very Special Arts. So the whole family was really saw the passion and the need to show people that people with intellectual disabilities um, could learn, just learn slower. And she chose the conduit of sports 
uh, to make that happen, to hope that people could realize what um, people with IDD could do. I think the biggest um, story that I think of when I think of Mr. Shriver's character is that when I was a regional director for Special Olympics International, um, we had a state that was having a gala and it was really um, floundering financially and programmatically. And I begged Mrs. Shriver to go and she said, okay, I'll go, but I gotta be home by uh, at least midnight and you've gotta figure out how to get me there and back in the same day. <laughs> so we went to this small state <clears throat> on a two-seater airplane. She and I were actually sitting on the floor of the plane with our legs outstretched. And I thought, wow, this woman has courage. <laughs> and so we went to the gala. It was a huge success. And on the way home, as we were flying very low in this plane and in, in, coming into Dulles, I said, well, what are you and Mr. Shriver going to do tomorrow? And she said, well, Sarge is having heart surgery tomorrow at 6 a.m. And I thought, my Lord, it is now past 1 a.m. And he's going to surgery at 6 and here I sit on this little plane with Mrs. Shriver. She could have gotten out of that in a heartbeat. People would have understood. But she knew that the athletes of that state were counting on her. So, I mean, it, it just shows miles and miles her heart and her passion for Special Olympics. Um, I think when you look at the things that she has done in the first 20 years that she um, was really um, pushing this movement forward, um, four or five things come to mind. Number one, she was a champion of legislation. She and her brother, the president, um, in the 20 years that he was in office and after, there was over 118 pieces of legislation centered around people with intellectual disabilities. There's actually an act named after her uh, to this day. Uh, when you look at physical education and recreation for people with um, IDD, um, our sports skills guides from Special Olympics really helped um, PL 94142, the Education for All Handicap Act, help all people with intellectual disabilities be able to have the joy of sports. Um, we're still using those today and they were a landmark back then when you think they were developed in 1975. She was a passion for sport, and if you're going to be a sportsman, you got to know the rules, and you got to play by the game, and you got to have good coaches. So coaches' education and certification and official certification were paramount to her, and that's, we've been doing coaches' education and certification since the 70s. So you have to look at that as she was a visionary in what, in what she was doing. She didn't go anywhere with asking an athlete what they thought about something, which was an eye-opener to many officials and many people in the states that she visited. Um, and so she was a champion as we began athlete leadership because of course she thought athletes should have a voice. They're our best voice. Um, she was advocating for inclusion back when it really wasn't a word. When I think back to 1991 at the World Games opening ceremonies and she said to the world, our athletes have the right to be on any field, any sports league, any school, any business. And you think about that. She just proclaimed to the world, <laughs> we, we know it, we earn it, and we should be included. And so that still blows me away. Um, the other things that um, I guess that I'm talking fast because I want to get through it, that she always had the best interest of athletes in her mind. And anybody that knows Mr. Shriver knows she was a, she had a penchant for equality, which meant divisioning, ability levels, a quota system should be fair and equal, and there should be no fees charged to any athlete or family that joins Special Olympics. She started that when she started Special Olympics, and to her dying day, she was still saying that about Special Olympics. She believed in that. Um, she believed that athletes could do anything in any sport that we could bring into umbrella was important. We went from three sports to 33. Imagine that, 50 years, three sports with all its rules, officials, et cetera, in a short amount of time. Um, she also felt that all ability levels should be included. <clears throat> and that's why, excuse me, we started the developmental events program, which morphed into the motor activities program, which morphed into lead up events in all sports. Um, so that's quite a progression of thinking about. She also felt very strongly about fitness 
and sports. And so she asked that we develop um, a walking program, which we field tested and did, and race walking, because she felt like agencies, families, and athletes and coaches could all walk together, became its our first official race walking event in the uh, 1987 uh, World Games in Notre Dame. And we've been walking ever since. <laughs> it's a great, it's a great fitness program. Um, we also, um, I guess, saw through Mrs. Shriver's eyes, the inequity of health. And so even Rosemary, um, a child of privilege, you might say, had health problems. And so this caused Mrs. Shriver to be like a bulldog to go after the health disparities for people with IDD. And so in the 90s, health programs were born. Um, and so when you think in every single decade, she has done a number of things that are profound, which in one's life, one or two things would be good, but that's amazing um, that she did that. And her vision for families and, and uh, children, um, she was a visionary in 75, she developed through the Kennedy Foundation, the Let's Play to Grow program, which actually is a pre precursor to our Young Athletes program, which is a feeder to all of our Special Olympics events, as you know, which is an amazing program for all families. Um, when you say, what was her passion? Her passion was the mission, 24-7, 365. It never stopped, believe me. <laughs> Going on trips with her and being in the office every day, I know that. You know, she was just a bundle of, of energy. But her passion was that anybody should be able to participate in the Special Olympics who wanted to. It should be fair and equal. And by golly, you should know that our athletes can learn any sport they want to, given the choice. And I think the biggest thing is everyone should be included. And that was from the beginning. Um, everybody saw that, but there just wasn't a name for it. And we weren't ready for it because she was showcasing athletes with inclusion um, before we, <laughs> people knew what inclusion was, I think. So it was a privilege to work for. I think everybody is touched by her. Um, I was a driven person going to work for Special Olympics, but I became more of a driven person <laughs> after working for Mrs. Shriver. It just, you can't help but let that um, bleed over into your life, I would say. So it's been a privilege and thanks for letting me share a little history. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Nancy. We appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to now turn it over to Dr. Armstrong. So would you maybe kind of share some insight in how you're connected with Special Olympics? Sure. Um, thank you for the chance to, to be here. Interestingly enough, when you when you think about Eunice and Nancy, thank you for, for doing that. She was everywhere. Um, and, and the fact that you had to up your game to keep up, everyone who has met her knows that it's almost an impossible task, but you, you try very hard. Um, you know, Eunice, uh, Eunice had, a, had a drive and a passion to, to make things happen. Um, she, her leadership um, with her brother, um, President Kennedy, really established the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development for research on intellectual and developmental disabilities. As you mentioned, she went on to be a major push for 94-142, our special education law, um, the Special Olympics, the VSA, all of these programs that were there, but we're tied to her in a very special way. She and Dr. Robert Cook were playing tennis one day um, at the home at uh, Hyannisport uh, on the Cape, and um, Mrs. Shriver tells me that she was beating him badly. Dr. Cook says that he was beating her and no one should beat Mrs. Shriver. But at any way, before the match was over, they came to the net and, and Dr. Cook said, you know, you've, you've done all of these things to create the National uh, Institute of Child Health and Human Development, to, to move toward inclusion, to move people out of, uh, of uh, um, institutions, but we don't have a workforce. And Eunice asked Dr. Cook if he had an idea and he said, I do. And she said, there's a pad and paper on the desk upstairs, go write it down. And so Dr. Cook, Cook put together the idea for university affiliated facilities that would be funded by the federal government and, um, and philanthropists to create training centers for a new group of professionals who would help to provide uh, the supports needed for 
um, individuals with developmental disabilities in community settings. Um, and that created uh, 11 of these UAPs, and the Mailman Center was one of those. Mrs. Shriver was supposed to have been in Miami for the groundbreaking. She unfortunately was diverted to Los Angeles for uh, because her brother Bobby had been shot that day. But she and Ted Kennedy were there when the, uh, the center opened in 1971. Our keynote speaker then was Jean Piaget, the famous Swiss um, psychologist, and, and things were on a roll. I met Mrs. Schreiber for the first time when her son Anthony uh, asked us to host the board meeting of the, the best buddies, and I was enthralled. I mean, this was one of my heroes, um, but that was the first of a, a number of meetings. She invited me to her home in Potomac for uh, an event, and, and as I walked in, Anthony took me over to where she was sitting, and she was sitting there in, in overstuffed armchairs with, with a very distinguished woman. Um, and she jumped out of her chair and pulled me over to the corner where we could talk quietly. She wanted to know what we were doing at the Mailman Center and what was happening. And, and then she took me back and introduced me to the woman he, she had just jumped up and left. And it was the president of the Israeli Knesset, um, the, the top uh, leadership role for a woman in, in the country of Israel. That was Mrs. Schreiber. When she was on, she was on and nothing else was, was going to stop it. I had the fortune to be invited to the NIH the day that the, um, um, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development was, was named after Eunice Kennedy Shriver, the only federal agency named after a person. Um, and one of the joys there was being able to, to see her and to see Sarge and, and to hear the various speakers and, and her brother, um, Teddy Kennedy, um, provided an insight that was really important for Eunice. Um, he said that all of the brothers and sisters had an open invitation to the White House, except Eunice, because Eunice always had an agenda. Um, and she did. She always had an agenda. Well, after that, that incredible day in Bethesda, when I returned back to, to work on Friday afternoon, I got a, um, a, my secretary met me and she said, Mrs. Schreiber called office called and she wants to come visit you on Monday. Well, we hustled to make the arrangement. She and Sarge showed up and I was just ecstatic to have another chance to meet and to talk about the Mailman Center. Um, and at this point, Mrs. Schreiber was about two years, a year and a half from, from her death. And, um, and at that point I thought, well, we might reminisce a little bit about her memories of the Mailman Center and the like. And we did. And then one of the most meaningful events of, of my life and our, and our life as a, as a center occurred. Um, she leaned over to me, she met with all the staff, we've got great, great photographs, but she leaned over to me and she said, okay, what's next? And that, those two words, or word with a hyphen, uh, really had driven the center uh, to be thinking about how do we really promote community inclusion? How do we address intersections between uh, disability and diversity? Um, how do we make sure that inclusion in, is real at all levels for all people, which was the, the real uh, push that Mrs. Schreiber had. And so when I look back on the, the 25 years or so, the multiple contacts that I had with her, and then I sit back and think that in my office, you know, you talk about sometimes you meet a celebrity, you don't want to wash your hands, and I've never washed those chairs because I had sitting in that room the creator of the Special Olympics, the UAPs, the driving force between 94-142, our special education law, the creation of the National Institute for Child Health and Human Development, a vice presidential candidate, and the designer of the Peace Corps. Um, it is really incredible what that couple, uh, driven by Mrs. Shriver's enthusiasm, uh, the lasting goal that they, uh, they had and, and the lasting impression that they made on all of us to inspire us to move forward. So thank you for giving me the chance to, to share those stories. They, they really made a difference for all of us. Thank you so much for that. That was wonderful to hear and very inspiring and um, sure appreciated by many people. So thank you so much for your time. Um, we're gonna move along to Andy and Anna Maria. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to you to share some of your stories. You want Andy or me first? 
whichever you want to andy you want to go first you me oh. right he wants you to go first um i met Eunice at um a board meeting of, um, when i was on the board of uh, best buddy and um i met her um for the first time there and then i also was with them um when i was at the white house which was quite an experience that Special Olympics selected us to go. And I right away I could tell that um, this woman had something so very, very special. Um, having a son, was an athlete at the time, uh, I could tell her passion to see them um, perform at uh, whatever level they were capable of doing it. And for me, um, an older mom, um, who had been in sports with my kids all the way through the other four. It was unbelievable to see that Andy um, would experience uh, every opportunity in every way that his brothers had. And that um, this lady who had so much energy and so much love for them would make everything possible for all, all of them. And that was such a rewarding and absolutely genuine love that I could see from her. I um, had one incident with her that I thought was absolutely unbelievable for me. I was at her house in Hyannisport and um, we had just been in a cycling event from Best Buddy. And I was walking around looking at all the pictures that she had with everything but the family. There was nothing but the family all over. It was really fascinating me. And all of a sudden she came by and she said, uh, Anna, I, yes ma'am, um, come on, let's go sit on the steps. And I thought, wow, I'm sitting on the steps of someone that is so absolutely unreal and who is taking my son almost by the hand and uh, showing him a world that I never even dreamed that he could be in or had any idea that sports would be part of his life. So for me, she was a tremendously special lady who I watched her follow just about every event at World Games in every way and a family that um, has been a tremendous uh, life in his life and in all of the Bihar's family life. So it's quite an honor for me to be here. And um, I know she's in heaven and let her know that um, we love her and we'll never forget her. Your turn. Hi there. Alrighty, Michael. I met Eunice for the first time at Anthony's house when she came. She would call. He would call my mother and tell her my mother is in town. Come to my house because my mother wants to see him and she wants to invite him for lunch at his arrival at that time. And I would go to Anthony's house on Miami Beach, where he lives now, then he, there, there I saw her, and there was the first time that I met her. What else? What else? Then we went on the boat to Fisher Island, and there she paid for the lunch and stuff like that. Now, um, do you remember what you always did in all your swimming meets and in the World Games? 
in the year 2007, no, summer games, she came. I didn't even know that she was there until I see Tim come in, but not her yet. So I saw Tim and then Tim raised her, raised his son like this to tell me, I'm here, I'm here. Then, then I see Eunice come in. The first thing she did, she raised her hand like this. I was the third person in the water. In the relay. In the relay. She had her hand up like this. And she did like this. When I saw that, I dove in and I very, very mine. Oh. You gave it your all. Yes. Uh -huh. His memories are very uh, much of a family that um, he visited quite often. And uh, whenever she came and uh, Tim came, he would, um, he would go over to Anthony's. And uh, so for him, um, Eunice was um, someone that was part of his life in a very special way. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you so much for that touching story. Um, that's just wonderful for all to hear. And um, I appreciate you guys being here today. Um, I do wanna turn it over to ask any questions. I know we have some members of the media here that um, might have some questions. I think there were some that were submitted earlier. So Carrie, um, do you want to pop on and maybe start fielding some of those questions? But again, like I said, any members of the media or anyone that have questions, if you want to use the chat icon up below, you can submit your questions and we can make sure to field those and ask those to any of our panelists here today. Yes, definitely. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Um, and again, you guys can send them in and we'll read them out for everybody. Um, but Andy, we kind of wanted to go back to you um, and hear what your favorite Special Olympics memory is. I know you have so many good ones, but if you could pick maybe your top one or your top one with Eunice as well. Okay. I was in the Estes when Eunice Kennedy Shriver was honored in Los Angeles and that Michelle Obama honored her to give the black her son Tim got it and he spoke so good about his mother that everybody <coughs> in the stadium started crying. Yeah, what a historic moment too, for you to be part of that, that's amazing. And then Michelle Obama said, just throw your hat across me like, Yes, because it just is part of your life too. Amazing. And if you have any photos, I'm sure we can find some videos to share too. Um, we can send that to the participants so we can share, you know, what that memory really looked like for you too. Um, and Nancy and Daniel, I know you shared a bunch of amazing memories too with Eunice, but um, kind of same question for you. If you could pick your favorite memory of her um, or even your favorite moment looking back over the years with Special Olympics. Oh, and there you go, the frame photo. <laughs> That's awesome. 
Thank you, Andy. She was, um, she was a friend. She was um, somebody that was very special in his life. And um, someone that he knew uh, what, what, he, what she was doing, what they all were doing, the whole family, what she represented, um, how much she loved all of them. And not only that, um, she he always would tell me, uh, we have to perform the very best we can. We got to do the very best we can. It was never a win that was in there. It was always the very best. She says the very best, the very best. He knew her in a, in a family atmosphere at Anthony's. And uh, that has remained in, uh, in his life throughout the years. The kids, you know, all of them growing up. Um, and he was right in the midst of it all. So for me, it was an unreal, unbelievable um, thing that I would have never dreamed. My husband and I were walking around in the White House and uh, we looked at each other and said, what in the world are we doing in the White House? <laughs> I mean, unreal, completely. For us, um, this is a program that has been one of the most important things in our lives goes through her and Andy and and Tim and Anthony in every possible way. And of course, that's Grandma sitting right there. And that's Nancy. <laughs> I Thank never you, Mama, yeah. <laughs> she was only eight years old and she came up to me and, and uh, they had, I didn't know who she was. And he said, you know, he's my number one grandson. And I said, oh, I see. And later on I said, Anybody knows who she is? And of course they told me, and I thought, oh wow. <laughs> My first <Yeah>, one. Surprise. <laughs> so it's been quite a dream. All through her, Special Olympics has been a total and complete way of life for my son and for the rest of the family, really. Yeah, definitely. All right, um, and Nancy and Daniel, if you want to share maybe your favorite memory of Eunice or your favorite memory with Special Olympics, I know it's tough to narrow it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and share. I, I, I hit the high points when I did my summary, but I, there, there was one other time that I really found to be a, a special point when I was visiting with her in Potomac. Um, one of the things that she asked me um, pretty much straight up was, well, you know, when the Mailman Center was first being funded and prepared to be built, the president of the University of Miami wanted to call it the Eunice Kennedy Driver Center. Should we? And she said, um, the reason that we didn't was that I really felt it was important for each of the local communities to have folks there who could champion the vision um, and to carry this out uh, in the way that we needed to have it uh, go forward, that it didn't all rest on my shoulders. Um, and I really took a lot from that because this was an opportunity where, you know, basically everything related to developmental disabilities in the United States could be called the Eunice Kennedy Shriver something or the other. Um, but she was also able to bring people in from all over the place. And when, I think when she looks at where we are today, um, whether it's the Special Olympics or the, now we call them the USEDs, uh, or any other programs, the NICHD, um, I think the one thing that Eunice would probably ask us now would be the same question she asked me in my office years ago. So what's next? Definitely, yeah. <laughs> Um, and we have a couple other questions that are coming in from media too. Um, and this one is for Sherry, Nancy, and Andy as well. Um, what do you hope to see happen for Special Olympics? And is there a personal goal that you hope to see happen within your communities? Um, so whoever wants to take that one first. <laughs> well, I guess I'll, 
I'll start just because when I think of um, those words, what's next, I mean, that's what's been driving us, I think, through all of our um, increases in sports opportunities, uh, leadership, wellness, and health. But when I think of what's next is something we've been working on the past couple of years. And it's amazing to think that in 1972, which is when Special Olympics Florida was founded, we started with a small training program up at Okaloosa County. And then fast forward on our 50th anniversary year in 2022, we're going to be hosting the for the first time ever at the USA Games for all of Special Olympics. So we're really proud and focused on that. And so, you know, what's next is, is putting um, our athletes uh, and giving them the most incredible memories ever possible to be on the national platform um, and have an extraordinary experience in Central Florida uh, with their families and all the volunteers. So that's what I think about what's next. Nancy, you're on mute right now. Okay. Oh, you're still on mute. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. I, I think just because um, starting in Special Olympics, it was very grassroots, just like Sherry said, everywhere I go and visit, I always ask, like to ask them if they know if they have a Special Olympics program in their community, in their city, their town, wherever we are. Because I still think, you know, our bonus is the grassroots effort, the volunteers, the passion of coaches and people who want to make the world a better place for people with um, intellectual disabilities and be able to start a Special Olympics program. And I guess because I've seen so much growth in Special Olympics. I assume that the rest of the country, now who knows about the world, we all know what the world is like, but that the rest of the country is booming um, in Special Olympics, but it's not. We have so many communities that are void of Special Olympics and it breaks my heart when I go to places and I ask that, but I think people still have to not take Special Olympics for granted in many areas and go forward, do the next step and, and be a game changer and look into it and see if you can bring Special Olympics to, to your community. I know we have small rural places in Florida, you know, that don't have, I mean, holy cow, we've done an amazing job, but there's always more to do. Um, and, and I see it as I visit other states, especially, and I think that's my dream, my hope is that we can bring Special Olympics to everybody who wants to be involved. Definitely. Um, and that kind of goes into another question that was brought up. Um, where do you see Special Olympics going in the next five years? That's a Sherry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, as Nancy mentioned, um, we our whole goal is to provide, um, you know, a ton of opportunities for anyone who wants to be part of the program. And we believe so much in the power of our programs that um, we do believe we want to see it in every opportunity for any athlete that wants to be part of it. And while we're serving about 60,000, there's north of 400,000 persons with an intellectual disability just in the state of Florida. So we definitely know there's room for growth. Um, we, um, as you mentioned, Nancy, I think the USA Games will help us provide a platform for people to learn more about what Special Olympics is doing and, and where it could be in their communities and how they could fit it into their lives. So I think the awareness of, of the quality and the impact of our programs is a huge focus um, for us in the next couple of years. And then, as I mentioned early on, um, really transforming um, the future is, is our unified partners or leaders who do not have intellectual disabilities coming together with our partner, our athletes. And so we see the opportunities to build like incredibly inclusive, um, accepting leaders with our um, the students that are in our you know middle schools, high schools, even elementaries that we're doing our unified programs in. And so really, that's where we focus on um, you know making our world um, in a truly inclusive first, um, first and foremost in not only just, um, you know, schools, but also in the workplace when they become leaders in, in their specific careers. So that's what we're hopeful for in the next three to five years at Special Olympics Florida. I think there's another thing that is really important because um, Special Olympics overall has worked 
in the last 20, 20 years very hard to, um, to train and include athlete leaders in everything that we do. And I think inwardly, we all, we all believe in it, but we have a long way to go to educate um, probably grassroots people, um, educators, agencies about the strength of our athletes, what they bring to the movement. And if given the chance, how they can lead in every aspect of Special Olympics, but they just need that opportunity. We're training a lot of people and we need places to place them, to be a part of the local programs, to be a part of committees, to be advocates, to fundraise, to do many, many things that we need help with all across the country. So I think, you know, my wish is that, you know, our leadership, our unified leadership grows and grows and our athlete leadership program um, grows exponentially with, with our program. And this one's for Nancy, Daniel, and Anna Maria. If Eunice was still here today, what do you think her reaction would be to how far this organization has come? What's next? She wouldn't say where it's gone. She'd say <laughs> what's next. She yeah. said that every day to us as staff. What's next? How do you make it better? That's what she would say. What's next and how do you make it better? <laughs> Can't add more than that. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Awesome. Um, and we have another question. Um, again, if Eunice was here today, what would you ask her in regards to the movement of inclusion in Special Olympics Florida in general? Um, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. You want to get, go ahead, Anna Maria. You got something? Me? Yeah, did you have something? Um, for, you mean, um, to move forward in in um, in what aspect? Well, um, I think that the athlete leadership program is absolutely fabulous. Um, the athletes are all learning how to, as uh, they get older, um, be part of um, the whole movement and be part uh, of coaching. Uh, they're learning to be. Um, not only just like athletes, but also participate in the coaching part. Um, in Bay Watchers, um, we have um, about four or five of them who are coaches now and um, who have groups that they themselves coach. We are uh, training in the ocean. Um, we go to the beach and um, we're training right now on the beach. And uh, we have quite a bit of them that are coming out to swim. So um, we'll have a lot more open water swimmers for the next competitions coming up than we had before. And um, I think that for all the athletes, it is um, a fabulous thing, something to look forward to, uh, considering the circumstances that you know we're inside. We all know what we have to do to be safe and um and that's um to me they should just keep moving i hear maybe um maybe by october or somewhere around there we will be able to start again i hope so um for the kids it's a way of life i think if more people um understood uh the strength of sport like Recently, we had a, an athlete from Florida compete the half Ironman. Um, what, what a feat for anyone, um, much less a Special Olympics athlete. If more people realize the things that our athletes can do and aspire to do and want to do, I think the world would grow in their perception of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities because the sky's the limit. You just have to have the opportunities to to get their foot in the door. Great. I also think that um, one of the things that Eunice would be asking us today is what are we doing to promote inclusion in the face of racism and social injustice? Um, it's the thing that's on the, on the table and she would be asking us what about our, our families, uh, our, our individuals, the children, the adults, who, f who face stigma because of a disability and because of their race or their ethnicity or the language that they speak or their gender. 
And so when we look at those kinds of issues, I think that would be one of the things that, uh, that she would be very much asking us today. Where, where are we in the midst of the social upheaval we have now for full inclusion? Yeah, and I think building on that is is how are we, you know, utilizing not just our our voices, but our athletes' voices in, in bringing awareness to that, um, you know, the social justice side of and equality. And so again, going back to what Nancy mentioned earlier, it's just the you making sure first and foremost we're always thinking about our athletes' abilities and how they can help move the mission forward versus ourselves or our teams. Gary, are we good on questions? Perfect. Okay. Um, well, I want to just uh, personally, and I know on behalf of Special Olympics Florida and Special Olympics, thank every single person for joining us today, whether you were listening in, you're a member of the media, our panelists, you were fantastic. Um, it's definitely inspiring to hear your connections to Eunice, um, your passion for Special Olympics Florida and the organization in its entirety. Um, hearing from you, I think we can all say that it's a true testament to how dedicated Eunice was um, to the organization and Special Olympics um, and the fact that you guys are there for so many families and individuals um, for so many years. So thank you so much for your time, um, your insights, your stories. It was truly an honor to hear from each of you today. So um, thank you for your time. And if anyone does have questions, you can certainly email us and we can um, field those as well. But um, thank you again all for joining us today. We appreciate it. Have a great one. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.